Hi, welcome to the Liverpool Community Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Johnson Lynch. And as you know, I like to interview people on a one-to-one basis uh, where we get to know them, a uh, little something about them and what they're doing and what they're all about. And I'm joined here by a lovely new friend that I just recently met, um, a woman named Maya Mitter. How you doing, yeah. Maya? Hi, Chase. How are you? I am fine, Maya, <laughs> and everything like that. And Maya is the development manager for Luma Creations I and am. everything. And uh, so, Maya, it's like a fascinating story uh, with a, with a uh, long history and everything. But because I'm pretty sure if you're from Liverpool, from the, the South End, you've heard of Luma Creations because of uh, one of its main owners um, is. Uh, well, Francisco. We all yeah. know him as Francisco. I was going to try and say his last name, but then I figured I would go, oh, yeah. what was it? Carrasco. Carrasco, yes. Yeah. Everybody know Francisco and everything. And I know and, and I know it'll be doing him a disservice because Francisco will be like, hey, how come I'm not doing this interview? Because he's in Chile. <laughs> well, there you go, Having Francisco. a great old time there. There you go, there you go. That's why. That's Running why. workshops, you know. Really? And oh, he's, he is, an he's interview. On? He's going to be on national TV and... He's literally working every day yeah, for yeah, two yeah. weeks. Well, see, not like, a holiday. He's always, he's always working. Yeah, and everything, you know, and um, it's just a holiday from us. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, uh, for those uh, who uh, don't are not familiar with Luma Creations, mm-hmm. can you give us kind of like a brief of what Luma Creations is all about? Yeah. Well, Luma Creations is a an uh, arts organization, I guess, you know, creative arts, and uh, we run festivals uh, and workshops, and mi- principally for the promotion of Latin American culture. But we also do things where we are, uh, you know, we run uh, like a series of workshops. So we've been doing this now for a couple of years, uh, called Creative Futures. And it's developing your business as an artist, creative oh, wow. artist. So you can do any kind of creative work, but it you know we take you through the process of what you need to do to set up, and you know, and we've been working that with, that like with the library. Support or? You, you you get that after the it's usually four weeks plus a panel, you know, discussion, yeah. um, and the, it's called. Uh, Rising stars, or something like that, you know, mm. we because because basically it's to show how people have have become famous, you know, uh, or are successful doing what they're doing, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just, you have there are certain processes, yeah, you know, ta- from taxing taxation to marketing, mm. all the different aspects of of that. So we do those kind of things, but we also do festivals and. You know, we and we have our own in-house group, mm. so Grupo Luma. Uh, you know, and they they sing Latin American songs. A lot of those are songs that Francisco has written. Yeah. Well, I thought what was interesting was is that um, you know, even though um, Luma's been around since around 2013 or 2011 yeah. or whatever and stuff like that. You actually said, you know, um, when lockdown hit, it was a blessing. For us, yeah. Right? And everything like that. And I've never heard anybody say lockdown was a blessing and everything. So, uh, but basically, as a growing organization for a little many years, like I said, mm-hmm. it was around lockdown that everything took off. Why don't you explain about that? Yes, we, we had to adapt. It was, it was sink or swim for yeah. lots and lots of companies. Yeah. And because we'd run a couple of sessions initially and saw that it was successful, you know, on Zoom, we moved everything onto Zoom and we adapted it so that we could make sure that all our participants got what they wanted and what they needed for, you know, doing some of the courses that that we ran. And well, workshops. And well, well, part of that growth, though, was because your main focus was around Latin American culture, mm-hmm. but you're also in Liverpool. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like in that fashion is when you hit Zoom, as you were saying, is you were able to actually communicate in the same space with people from other countries yeah. internationally. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I mean. Well, say. what happened also was that the the lockdown was such a shock yeah. that people were so happy to have something to do. Oh. And I think they were also very concerned about not being able to meet the, the you know, complete their courses, uh, you know, whatever they were doing, they were worried that they weren't going to be able to do it. But then we thought, no, we, you know, we have a responsibility uh, to, mm. to meet those demands. So that's what we did. And then when we did our very first feria, which was, you know, we had these big plans, which all, of course we couldn't do. Yeah. We thought, actually, this could be a good thing because we can bring artists from around the, the whole of the Latin American diaspora yeah. to people in, in you know, in this country, yeah. you know. Um, so we broadcast, you know, uh, with from different little countries around Latin America. We had people who came on there. I, I, I can't remember the names, but the two guys came and they should, did like a little cooking show. Yeah. Uh, there were dance troops that, you know, so they could wear the full costumes and do dances outside, you know. Yeah. And so you got to see a little bit of the Latin American countryside. And, you know, we had groups, we had panel discussions about art and creativity and, you know, about Latin America and mm. politics, all kinds of things. It was so, so successful, you know, that, you know, we saw the numbers growing every day, yeah. you know, uh, f f for the amount of people that were watching it. Now, you now you were saying the word, but I mean, I guess maybe it will help to explain it a little bit more, is that you were saying La Feria. Yeah. And everything, but basically, so this is the festival that you guys launched in yeah. uh, 2020. Yeah. Tell us what the La Feria Festival is or means. Okay, la, f la feria is is a word like a festival sounds, you know, like Womex or something like that. But yeah. this is broader. This is a broader context in the sense that we have you can you can have things like a theater and dances, you know, but they're all culturally based, and you can have parades and uh, you know uh, just it's 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 a bit more organic mm. than than a festival which is a lot more corporate yeah. in some sense um and we wanted to make sure that we brought a wide range of well like you said it has yeah. also its level of creativity as yeah. well like you know um, people could do different type of things within that context yeah like within that soup or whatever yeah stuff like that you know um but this also probably led to, like, uh, this big sense of funding that you got from the Arts Council. Yeah. But also, you're one of those groups that actually have achieved more than just getting funding. I mean, you got, like, as you said, with NPO status. Yeah. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? That is very, that is a big deal. Yeah. Um, because it allows us to exceed in the sense that we, uh, the, the previously the funding, wh whatever we got, there is only so much that we can do yeah. with that bit of money because we have to pay our artists. We have to pay, and those are things that, you know, we, we don't want to keep people waiting because we know what it's like to have to wait for money. And so, you know, we pay them right away. We make sure that they all have, you know, Everything and these everything costs so much. Well, travel, exactly, food, hotels, whatever, exactly. Anyway. So, we haven't been able to to to, to expand mm. our dreams in some in some sense. So we've actually managed to 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 do that. This this funding, the NPO funding, has allowed us to, you know, uh, to rise to the challenges that the Arts Council have have expect from us. Yeah. So, you know, we have to do certain uh, things that we have to meet certain challenges that they have. We were already on our way to do those things. So, 
yeah. you know, because uh, those are things that they don't just happen overnight. No. So they have to, you know, it's incremental. And so literally we've been working our way towards that anyway. So. But then also too is like, you know, so when lockdown ended, you know, you were able to actually, um, you know, uh, fully bring Laferia to life. Yeah. But like, instead of it just like being like, some kind of like a showcase like in Sutton Park or you know, something like that, you managed to be in like big major, you know, locations throughout yeah. the city, such as yeah, such as we went, we we were at the Unity Theater. Mm -hmm. We were in, we've been in the music room at the uh, at the Philharmonic Hall uh, District. Uh, you know, we always have a really good response to things that we do at District, um, and Liverpool Life Museum. Yeah, like that, like, and, and also we we also did something in the in the World Museum yeah. as well. Wow. You know, we did like a Day of the Dead. Really? Oh yeah, oh that was God. so yeah, much yeah, fun. Yeah, I can imagine that. that. Was, and one of our board directors is Mexican. Yeah. Uh, Betty Ortiz, and she made this altar. You know that they have. Wow. It was in the in the in the foyer of yeah. World Museum. It was amazing. And then we had workshops, so and you know, people made up and everything. Yeah, and, and yeah, oh. yeah. We did like a little puppet show, and right. they have a theater in that building, and yeah. so you know, so it, it it's we we can we can do so much more now because we have that security, and we know the things, the targets that we have to meet. Yeah, you know, yeah. so those are really good guidelines for us, you know, and. I, I, this year was such a success that I, I was like, I was saying, oh, we've got to top that next year. So we have to think big for next year again. Yeah. Well, also, too, is like you've expanded it out to where now you, I think we call the Latin American Artist Network. Yeah, the Latin American Artist Network uh, is, is to is to level up, I guess. Yeah. To use the word of the day, the yeah, words of exactly. the day. Use that word from the flash. Yeah. Level up, man. <laughs> uh, you know, I... Because everything goes to London. Yeah. You know, everything know, is so London centric, and people, a lot of the artists don't want to come up from London. You know, they all say, "Oh, you know, we're in London. Well, let's do this here." But actually, one of the things that's happened is now that we've had all these big groups over here. Mm. In Liverpool, we now have people saying, "This is pretty good, you know. Let's go up there." So yeah. we have people wanting to, to come up, and so we've developed this to promote uh, Latin American artists in the north of England. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so we just the north of England, um, so right across towards Newcastle, we've built. Uh, you know, relationships with people in Sheffield and Leeds and, you know, different uh, communities across the north of England, you yeah. know, um, to be able to kind of work in collaboration, uh, you know, in tandem with, with, with them on different uh, projects. And they come and support us and we go and support them. You know, and Francisco and Grupo Luma have been playing different cities along yeah. uh, around they've even been down to that london place and <laughs> performed that, London, the, that that London, London place that London thing. yeah well i mean i guess also too is you know you probably want to give a like a shout out to like your favorite band that you got to actually bring here <gasps> no and afrobeat i yeah. love them i love them yeah 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 no. and the iron irony was that i couldn't actually go and see them that night Really? Because I wasn't well. And oh, I, you, you didn't go to see them. I thought you went to see them. I, but that was at Africa Oye last oh, okay. year. And I, I missed missed no end. But I know they'll be back. Yeah. I know we will get them back again. Yeah. But then I also met this other group of... Uh, it was led by a chinchinera uh, called... Uh, the band is called um, Bandito Inquieta. And they're so much fun. Uh, young girls who'd never been 
to England before, wow. and they basically had the city eating out of their hands. People were asking me, where, where, where can we see them? And, you know, it's like, yeah. I'm sorry, but the tickets are all sold out. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So I bring BTS over here or something. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> K-pop, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I totally get you. I totally get you. So, I mean, you know, so, I mean, like, that's La Feria Festival and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, you also, with Luma Creations, you're always trying to create new projects and everything mm -hmm. like that. So, there's a project that you guys, I wouldn't say you just finished, but you kind of, like, just finished, like, like the, the workshop workshops yeah. kind of thing um, called the Stitch in Time. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Stitch in Time? Yeah. The, the, the Stitch in Time is actually been a, a project that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. Right. And because I, I think that oral storytelling isn't the only way to tell mm -hmm. stories. And some people are visual, so that you need to, they can create stories through art and tapestries and things like that and and so francisco had been telling me about the, the story about how women in chile were when everything was banned uh you know because because of the the coup you know uh the the, the regime at the time pinochet's regime banned everything you know there were military people to ensure that these things weren't happening, if you were caught, and you would, it didn't matter what you did, if you were against the government, you disappeared. Yeah. So thousands and thousands and thousands of citizens have disappeared, and this was in a way of telling stories, and they'd use the gunny sacks, you know, the, the sacks that potatoes came in, uh, so you know, and, like and material right? and thread and think to tell the stories about the families that had disappeared and so this it was sort of an underground movement of the apiera you know being sent across to people to tell the stories of what had happened to them so i thought this would be a great way of uh, of incorporating the traditions of chile uh, and using it for people in the city to tell their stories. Mm. And so the first, we started about three years ago, we had a workshop where we learned just the techniques. So we had a series of 12 workshops where we created and we learned different techniques from batik to printing to sewing, you know, embroidery, that anything that you, could, you wanted to learn we had somebody to teach us, and and, and this um, maker is Liz Shelbourne. Yeah, she's one of our neighbor artists um, at at John Archer Hall, where we uh, operate from. And um, then we used that for a project she did that tied up with a uh, feria last year, which was about uh, sustainability, and so we. The, the, An identity, right? Sorry. An identity. Yeah, but that 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 was this year. But last year we did the sustainability, and so we used that to create uh, something that she was doing for her masters, and then she built this beautiful dress that uh, one of the dancers from Mexico, Megali Flores, wore. You know, and all that came from that stitch in time kind of uh, project. And so this year, uh, because of the funding, we were able to run the this year's Stitch in Time uh, based on the Apiera, and we used all the things that we'd learned over the last two years to develop our project, which was about journey and identity. Right. So uh, we finished the, the workshops on Wednesday, and we're planning to have an exhibition um, at the end of January, early February, uh, I think it's called the Heritage Center in St. George's Hall. Right. It's on the side. Yeah. So um, that's very exciting. So that's in the new year. Yeah. Wow. Nice one. That's, that's 
really sounds amer- amazing, especially about how you were saying that it's also about using recycled, you know, fabrics. And, yeah, uh, we wanted recycling. to be maintain. We wanted to maintain a minimum of eighty percent recycled mm. material. Yeah, nice. So I mean, like again, fantastic uh, projects going on. And I think around this time, that's where I usually ask a person, you know, like, you know, what's your origin story? You know, and I mean, but before I guess asking you your origin story, you'd be like, what's the origin story of Luma? You know, and you were telling me about how um, basically set up by Francisco and a gentleman named Freddie. Yeah. Who were cooks. The well, they, 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 they owned a the restaurant. The they owned a restaurant, restaurant, El Rincon. Yeah. Which is very, which was very, very popular during, uh, you know, this was, I would say, early, sort of run about, when I started going there was, I would think, about 2007. Mm-hmm. I think I was going there about 2007. Right, right. So, right, right. from there, and then... But they were already also doing workshops while yeah. they were working in restaurants. Yeah, well, yeah, because the restaurant was mainly at evening. Yeah. So during the day, they went around schools, um, running different types of projects. But they were also, before that, the the Latin American community kind of work that they've been doing for quite some time. They did, they had festivals and they did all kinds of things. And they, they participated in different types of projects which weren't always... For this, but because of the way that they were created and drumming, especially with drumming, mm. you know, they they took part in, in parades and things like that in um, uh, in Chester, you know. I can't remember where it was, but Francisco was on top of one car, on top of another car, and then he was in a chair. Mm-hmm. It was very precarious, and then he was drumming. Wow. And while it was moving, <laughs> it did not look safe at all. Man got skills. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but, I mean, I just thought it was interesting, like, they couldn't really decide on a name and everything, because at that time, they were all things Latin. Well, they they, they started as all things Latin, yeah. then it was one Latin culture, and then it became OLC Productions, which you felt was just too corporate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, well, so it's around this time that you went to the parade. Yeah. And everything. So how did you how did you get involved? Well, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to the, the name. I found the name because I I was looking for something that would represent the company as such, yeah. and. And I was thinking of this tree, which is called Luma, and it can grow up to 30 meters tall. Mm. And I thought that the the uh, image of a tree, uh, which is sort of very vast and has beautiful colors on it, and the bark changes color, wow. and you know the the beautiful white flowers on it. And I thought, you know, well, this is kind of like. As you know, it's got the arms, uh, which is the branches of family, because that's what we like to think of ourselves as, yeah. a family, of community. And so the people who come and uh, join us, you know, they become part and parcel of the Luma identity. Yeah. Well, kind of makes me think about this is like a Luma tree. Or something. Behind me. Yeah. It's plastic. Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> Let's move uh, on. on. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so yeah, so you're now part of uh, Luma and everything, but um, you also uh, somehow, um, you, you've seen an advert, or I think it was, whatever, about documentary yeah so. from two of my friends went to do a documentary course I'm like oh i wish i had known this because you know i i want to be in a position to be able to tell stories and do justice to the people who tell these stories you know um so i went up uh 
Francisco couldn't go because he was ill. So I had to make that horrible drive to <laughs> Media City, which I really yeah. don't like doing. Mm. Um, and I uh, had a great day. I was quite surprised, you know, because I was quite frazzled from the yeah. drive. You know? Well, once you're there, you're there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then I have to think, oh, the drive back. But, yeah. <laughs> but when I was there, we, I learned more about the way that you, you have to pitch for, you know. For, for, ideas. Yeah, for ideas and what different agencies are looking for, you know, the, different broadcasting uh, yeah. formats and things yeah, like that. Yeah, making a documentary is not the same as making a film. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I had some ideas, mm. which, you know, I was quite lucky that they were accepted, you know. Um, a lot of them, you know, don't get accepted, even yeah. if the idea is good because it doesn't have a fit with the with the organization you're pitching it to, you know? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, it's like, okay, I got I to gotta make this now and everything. And uh, But one organization that decided to take you on board with your ideas um, was made in Manchester. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Good yeah, that's good <laughs> yeah, that's who I work with. Yeah, and um, so, you know, but I thought it was really interesting know ask you about some of the documentaries that you worked upon because you know I mean did one on Woodstock you know but you also did one on the birth of Rolling Stone magazine yeah that's right yeah tell me about that yeah because I met these amazing I, I have a really wide circle of artist friends in New York um, really interesting characters and I actually want to do a documentary on on that scene you know songwriter right you know and poets mm. and uh, I remember meeting uh, Michael Leiden who was the first editor of the very first Rolling Stone magazine right. he was must have been about 20 21 years old and he literally you know, uh, he was literally, I think they just went around and they, it, they printed it on something more like a newspaper, mm. uh, like a folded newspaper magazine. And he wrote this arti article on on making money. I think I think it was about the Monterey Jazz Festival. Oh, Monterey, something. yeah, yeah. I think it was, I'm, I'm not quite sure now, but... He wrote that, that article, and it was on the front page. Mm. And then there was a photograph of uh, John Lennon on the front, the top, with his army helmet, helmet yeah. yeah, army helmet and his national health prescription glasses yeah. on, uh, which was uh, taken by Baron Woolman. Mm. Uh, you know, and so these guys were great friends, and they traveled all over their stories incredible because they became friends with people like uh you know janice joplin Jimi hendrix because they went they weren't famous at the time at the time of woodstock these these they were all just beginning their yeah, journeys and so you know he, he the, the, the the sort of legacy of of photographs and stories is immense yeah. And so I used to always joke with Michael Leiden and tell him, I say, you're my pension plan, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to exploit all your stories. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and it was so lovely because, you know, I, I messaged him and said, you know, hey, the BBC have accepted my idea yeah. for uh, the ro birth of the Rolling Stone magazine. You know, would you come talk about it? Wow. You know, so we interviewed him, uh, you know, studio to studio. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because you know, these were like, uh, it was also, it's like you said, it was for the BBC World Service, but it was uh, more of a radio document. Yeah, it was, and, yeah. And stuff like that. It's, I mean, it's fascinating. But what I found most fascinating was, I guess, uh, one of your recent ones um, about uh, the Night Witches of World War Two. Yeah. 
Now, I, I love reading about these stories because it's stories that we should all know. It should be in history books and stuff like that. And, um, you know, but tell us about the Night Witches because that was a very interesting story. Yeah, the, well, the Night Witches are the, these were women uh, pilots mm -hmm. who were recruited because obviously they were, there was a great loss of lives in the Russian, uh, you know, sort of not just, not just the ground uh, and the military, ground military personnel, but also air, you know, and sea. There was there just uh, thousands and thousands of lives lost. And so they came up with the idea of, of getting some, because they noticed there were a few women who had flown some of these planes. They were like so, old crop dusters. Well, the, they were given those, but uh, at the, they'd flown like proper planes. Oh, okay. And then I, so they thought, okay, you know, why don't we get a little, a, you know, a little army of, of women pilots, you know? So they, they found one person, and, and then she was instrumental in bringing in lots of other people mm -hmm. and, and saying to them, you've, you, you know, you, you've, you've been an engineer on, on this thing, so come and help us. And so they were given these crop dusters mm. and they were wooden. You could barely fit three or four people in there at the yeah. most, but there's nowhere. There was, it was not made for carrying bombs. Yeah. So they had to put the bombs on the wing, and then somebody would be hanging on to the bomb, right. so it didn't fall. Yeah. You know, <laughs> prematurely. So then, when they would fly towards the target, they would switch the engine off and just glide. Imagine the the size and weight of a wooden crop duster. I know. That's and they would, and it's because wow. of that sound that they made as they were gliding in, that they were called because it sounded like broomsticks and witches. Yeah. So they were called the night witches. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, now, that's an important part is that they glided in because they had to turn the engines off. Yeah, because they didn't want to be caught. Exactly. So they would slide in, and then when they came over to the target, which obviously. You know, they were just having to guess. Yeah. <laughs> kind of yeah, roughly. It's not like that. Like yeah. some like scope or yeah. anything like that. No, so, it's yeah. a crop duster. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They would then release the bomb. And, you know, they were shot at. Lots and lots of yeah. the women lost their lives. You know? Wow. Uh, you know, because it was easy to. They were easy targets. Yeah. But they were, you know. They were spendable. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Yeah. They were a fodder, cannon fodder, basically. But, I mean, it still is an amazing story. It is an amazing uh, story. Amazing story of her heroism. Yeah. Heroism. Yeah, <laughs> and stuff like that, you know. And I love the name Night Witches. So somebody should be making that movie. You know, I the think there is. Movie. There are a couple of movies, and I think there, there is a... I'm not sure whether he's, he's been funded, but there was a guy, I think somewhere like Somerset... Wow. ...who... I think has had this in the pipeline, but I'm not sure whether he's completed the yeah. film yet. Oh, well. But they're I all in the history it. books. Well, uh, I think in Russia, I, I'm pretty sure that it was in actually started up in in the Ukraine. Mm. I th I think that the first pilots, or majority of the pilots, were from Ukraine. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Ukraine back in the news again. All right. So, you know, I got to tell you, this has been really a, a fascinating um, journey um, and, and story here, Maya, and everything like that. You know, um, if anybody was interested in volunteering with uh, Luma Creations and stuff, how would they go about it? How could they find you? Well, they can find us on Facebook uh, and on Instagram and Messenger. Uh, you know, the usual social media and Twitter, or X, I think it's called now. Uh, by, by, by looking at lumacreations.org. Yeah. 
Luke Lima Chris. <laughs> We're, uh, we, we have to update our uh, yeah. thing. But you can get our number and you can, you know, yeah. WhatsApp us or send us a message on Messenger. You know, we will definitely get back to you. That's how it do. Yeah. That's how you do. And everything else like that. And um, so as we already said that um, you have a Stitch of Time exhibition coming up at the end of January at St. George's Hall. Mm -hmm. And then, but also um, the La Feria, the next La Feria Festival will be in September? September 2024. September 24, and everything, you know, again, fascinating stuff. This is what it's like to be creative in this city. You know, uh, there's all kind of uh, things just for you. Um, so I would like to thank you once again, Maya Mitter, for coming in. Thank you so um, much for having me. joining me here in the studio and everything. And uh, you've been listening to the Liverpool Community Podcast. Please like and subscribe. You know all that stuff that they always say and everything. And you know what? For now, we out of here.